Hi, this is Chet Czar. Welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. I am your host. Today we have an excellent interview with my old art buddy, Chris Cooksey. Now you know Chris Cooksey uh, from his incredible Baroque sculptures, kit bash sculptures, kind of. You you know his work, if even if you don't know his name, but you probably do know his name. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I've been wanting to have him on the podcast from day one, pretty much. He's been on the list, so very cool to finally get him on, and we had a really fun conversation. Perfect, perfect episode for Thanksgiving, really. It's a little, it's a little special because Chris is a little special. So, um, yeah, let's see what's been going on with me. You know, I've been knuckling down and uh, waking myself up at five in the morning and working on this book because I had a bunch of pen and ink illustrations to do for it, and you know, making progress. Making progress is taking longer than I, as the whole process has taken longer. But you don't want to hear me talk about that again. Uh, but I am working on it, getting things done. Just finished a whole bunch of pen and ink, you know, like uh, 15 or 20 pen and ink illustrations. It came out really well. And um, today I'm going to finish up some some other Photoshop stuff for the book and uh, and then get ready for my sale on Friday. I'm going to have a Black Friday, Cyber Monday sale or whatever. I got to get these mystery boxes ready because mystery boxes are coming as well as a print release from my melt painting from the, the one of the tool posters I did. Um, and yeah, I think those are the two big things, but I got to get a bunch of new items for the mystery boxes because I really want to change them up and have them be cooler than last year. Anyway, um, if you uh, if you go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash chetzar, you can get, uh, you'll be notified before anybody else. You'll get the opportunity to buy things before anybody else, before the general public, for as little as a dollar a month. Also, if you want to be a uh, support the Dark Art Society podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash dark art society, and that goes to, you can join for as little as a dollar a month, and that goes towards supporting the podcast as well. It wouldn't be happening without your support. So um, if you like the podcast, you can support it for as little as a dollar a month on Patreon or uh, dark, patreon.com slash Dark Art Society. Anyway, here's some new subscribers. You also get your uh, podcast early, and you get your name read on the show, like I'm going to do right now. <clears throat> here's new subscribers. Who just joined the Patreon? Uh, let's see. Rob Freitas upped his pledge. Thanks, Rob. I want to have Rob on the the show soon. He's a, a amazing mold genius from my Rick Baker days. Um, okay, we've got Tony Garaldi Brown. Thank you for joining. Lee Petty and Joe Volan. Thank you for supporting. Couldn't do this show without your support. And, uh, yeah, you get in the Dark Art Society secret Facebook page and you get entry into the website, which has all kinds of cool stuff happening. It's really a great community. The Dark Art Society is really uh, a great community. It's small and everybody interacts and supports each, each other. It's pretty amazing. And it's growing. So... Come on in. All you got to do is pay $1 a month. That's $12 a year. That is really cheap. It's really cheap. That's like, what is that? That's 25 cents an episode. Anyway, um, I guess that's about it. Working on this book, getting up early, just trying to get things done before the holidays, getting ready for my sale. Yeah, that's it. Nothing exciting. Just, you know. Grinding it out as usual. So let's get on with this interview. All right. I know you're going to love it. It's a really great one. Chris Cooksey. Here we go. 
Hope you enjoy it. Here it goes. It's just about to start right now. Hey, Chris. Hello. Hello. Hello again. We just said hello two seconds ago, but hello again <laughs> for the purposes of the people listening. Yeah. Well, it's an honor. Thank you so much for asking me. The so. honor is, is mine, man. Thanks for coming on. I mean, we go way back. I've been a fan of yours from way back, back like back in the old early days of the internet. We used to talk yeah. online, right? Exactly. Yeah. Back when your your website was like had paintings, you know, that was kind of like <laughs> uh-huh. you're the, the gallery, you had paintings and a few sculptures too. It was like, that was part of your, you know, repertoire back then. Uh, my pre-Cambrian era. Yeah. My, my Jurassic Park. <laughs> 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 They're great though. People, I, I don't think a lot of people realize what an amazing painter you are though. I mean, those paintings on there, are amazing. Yeah. You know, that was my thing. That was my, go to college, get an art degree thing. And, um, the whole sculpture thing just kind of hijacked everything. It's kind of one of those, um, you know, you, you force your ego on what you think you're going to do, but it decides and chooses you. So, (laughs) you know, I didn't, uh, put up too much of a fight, you know, well, I always wanted to build things and that was, you know, that was me by nature. And so I, I was definitely happy to go in that direction. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I had a, a similar situation with music. Like I was, while I was working in makeup effects, I was try well, since I was like maybe 18, I was trying to make it in music, like be in a rock band or a punk band and make it, you know? And um, I did it for like 10 years and I tried really hard. I tried really hard, and the bands were good. The music was good. It just was like the timing wasn't right. And eventually I was pointed to, um, you know, circumstances kind of led me to painting, which I never considered because my dad was a painter, and he was, you know, the money was always up and down. We were completely broke, or, you know, he got sold something, and then it was like, oh, we got money. Oh, no, we're broke again. And it was just like my whole childhood was like that. So I never considered really considered being a painter until way, you know, I was like 33 when I decided. And it was one of those things like, uh, as time went on, I'm so glad I didn't get, I wasn't a successful musician because so much changed right after that with like downloading the music industry totally changed. And now with COVID, especially like bands are kind of getting screwed, not being able to play live and stuff. So yeah, kind of all works out in the end if you're willing to follow the lead, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, interesting times. And, you know, us artists, we kind of seem well adjusted to the uh, current apocalypse. So it's. <laughs> we're, 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 we're adjusted to the apocalypse lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. That's what keeps coming up. It's like, you know, many of the people I talk to, and myself included, are just like, you know, not that much has changed for me. Like mm. as far as my lifestyle, other than you know wearing a mask when you get groceries, but and then you know wiping things down and stuff like that, and washing your hands. But I'm I'm solitary in the studio anyway, all the time. It's been like yeah, that forever. I, so yeah, I agree. Same here. And I even kind of have I have a little bit of OCD, you know, mm-hmm. and so you know I kind of cringe. Like I do not like getting paint on my hands. Like oh. <laughs> wash them and so you know if i go out jump back in the car oh hand sanitizer time yeah (laughs) (laughs) so i you know i don't really know your history i mean i know we we've like like i said we've talked for years we used to you know talk through email and stuff i think and maybe on forums or something um but i don't really know your like your childhood art experience you know like were you an art kid from the very beginning which i'm assuming probably (laughs) Um, yeah i was very artistic at such a young age now i grew up in rural america kansas wow and so you can imagine like how very little actual art exposure i had 
And so, uh, you know, and I was babysat by my grandmother. My mother had to work all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm from that era too. Yeah. Same with my mom. Latchkey kids. (laughs) Yep. And, you know, having four television channels to have access to. You know, Sounds I funny spent, now. Yeah, I spent a great deal of time just trying to be creative. I would go outside a lot. I was in nature a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, my grandmother lived in a very rural area. There was a river nearby, so that was fascinating. There was an old barn that was falling apart, so wow. you could tell it was just sort of the right mix for, you know, developing an imagination and, you know... I had this kind of quasi spiritual spirituality with death and dying and, you know, just being around farm life coming across, uh, death in that sense was, right. you know, was, and then my mother getting involved in Catholicism, that was kind of a, an interesting mix that sort of spiritualism and death. And, mm-hmm. uh, of course I, came into Catholic guilt as well. So <laughs> natural body urges at a young male's life was definitely, yeah, you know, you go to to that. <laughs> so that fueled a lot of, uh, you know, ideas in my art and, you know, uh, trying to find channels of, you know, teenage rebellion. I found heavy metal ah. and, Iron Maiden was like my savior. (laughs) It's good for that. Yeah. And Iron Maiden album covers were incredible. We just talked about that on the last episode. We were talking about the Iron Maiden album covers. Oh my God. Yeah. So funny. Wow. Uh, So, you know, I would draw a lot, uh, you know, in school, I kind of had a reputation that, you know, I was the artist, Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, also, kind of the black sheep as well because you know my family extended family were just like as um rural as all stereotypes could be wow. but you know i could have easily fallen into that mm-hmm. i could have easily i would have no other influence or perspective to be anything different but i just naturally couldn't follow that like I had no inclination to have any kind of ill feelings towards any kind of group or race or any of that. Mm -hmm. And I had such empathetic heaviness just weighing on me in daily life. And so I think seeing what my mother went through with uh, abusive relationships and alcoholism, Mm -hmm. uh, I never knew my father. My father was completely bacon in my life he uh couldn't uh accept that i was his child and so you know living with that shadow you know it's just all big mixture of you know who i ended up being and yeah Yeah. it's It's heavy it's heavy yeah it is very heavy and you know in the year 2000 i met my father for the first time On his deathbed. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's intense. Yeah, so he lived in neighboring Missouri in a town called Humansville. (laughs) I go to Humansville, Missouri, (laughs) where, uh, you know, I meet his wife, this lovely lady named Tony, and you know, some of his neighbors, you know, this is this, yeah. Have you watched the show Ozark? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's where the setting is. Right. The Ozarks. Wow. And, you know, people wake up at 9am and start drinking. Wow. And playing the banjo. I, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Tony would wake up, start drinking beer and playing the banjo. And <laughs> we go to the hospital, this tiny hospital, where my father's decaying and death and, you know, to, to meet somebody who is your father for the first time right. as he's dying, just hours before he dies. Like that's crazy. Was he conscious? Uh, I, you know, he, 
could murmur things. You know, he would moan. Hearing him moan, it sounded like my voice. Oh, and so my God. Very creepy part. Yeah. You know, I have some older brothers that experience more of that trauma of a father leaving them. Mm-hmm. So, but they had later reconnected with him. So, you know, they obviously had a different relationship with him than I did, you know, which was just, you know, the beginning and the end all at once. Yeah, I, I wonder which is worse. I wonder which was worse, yeah. not knowing I, him or having yeah. a relationship and then have and then being left. You yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it was a very big mixture of feelings, and it just amplified what was already there for me. Right. Um, I lost my grandmother in 83. I was 10 years old. Uh. So that was a big, um, you know, part of my life that, you know, dealing with, you know, someone is so close to and, it, you know, could talk to. And she her, herself was intelligent. She was smart enough to, you know, teach school. And but, you know, she chose the farm life, had 10 children. Wow. And um, she you supported know, so, you, right? Like your artwork, yeah. your creativity and stuff. Yeah. You know, she was, uh, you know, but she didn't understand Star Wars, you know, like <laughs> I was big into Star Wars, showing her all my action figures and their names. And <laughs> she would just sort of skull like, oh, that's just make believe. <laughs> <laughs> it's just make believe. <laughs> that's cool. I mean, it's like it, it, it doesn't take you don't have to understand it as like a, as like a caretaker or a parent or something. You just have to have like an open heart in a way, I think, you know what I mean? It's like, I've known people that were not, or I mean, even like my parents, my, or my mother and my, my stepdad, even my biological dad, they were all cool with me doing monster stuff. I don't know that they necessarily understood it, but they were cool with it. It's like, you don't have to understand it. You just need to be okay with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, Which, you know, thankfully my mother was. Oh, good. I had, um, you know, other, I had another stepfather who, you know, again, fit the total rural, narrow-minded kind of viewpoint, alcoholic. Um, You know, he, you know, he supported it, but when the idea of college came up, like, like oh i don't know about that that's expensive (laughs) yeah (laughs) so you know and college was just like oh wow this is my this is my route to escape right yeah it must have been a shocking difference yeah and you know i just wanted to be around people who were enlightened and you know were positive and you know my my stepfather was very ignorant very racist very uh pro-gun you know, I would shoot him. I would see him shoot animals on property that we lived on, and you know, it was just hard to, you know, have a conversation with him without I can imagine triggering him or upsetting him. And damn, so, yeah. So you know, just just to get away from that and go to college was a huge thing. And you know, a couple of years into college, um, our art department sponsored a trip to Europe. And so there was about 20 of us in the SAR department that got to go to Europe. And that was a huge thing for me. That was the first time I was ever on an airplane. Wow. (laughs) Amazing. Uh, Yeah, this is 1994. And here I am uh, in college. I like super long hair. (laughs) Uh, And here I am in Europe. And that, wow, that trip. You know, I got to see real art, serious art, right? architecture. Yep. So we toured Amsterdam, down through Germany, and then down through Italy, and I was completely blown away. That must have been such a happy time for you. I imagine it must have been so exciting and fun and... Yeah. Yeah, it was. And, um, you know, around that time, I started discovering, you know, artists that really, really influenced me, like... Dali and Giger mm-hmm. had this friend in this painting class. He was like this metalhead guy. And he comes in one day with this book 
called Necronomicon 2. Yep. <laughs> and I was just, my mouth was just open for yep. half an hour just staring at this, like, oh my God, like, wow. You know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, finding your savior. That's, I mean, I had that same experience with Giger. Yeah. It's in the documentary. This guy made a documentary about me. There's, it's, it was significant enough to where it's like, it's, it's in the stories of the documentary, but it was, to me, it was like, I can't, I, it's like, I can't believe, this is like something I've never seen. It's like, he's painting a place that exists. That's how I felt. Like, I can't believe how, and you have this kind of like intuitive sense that it's not, He's just not making up a bunch of junk. It's like there's something more to it. I don't know what there is, but it's like it seems real. It feels it feels real and inspired somehow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was definite uh, influence on me, and um, you know, and I didn't feel like uh, I didn't feel compelled to like you know have to copy him. Right. But it's like I got it. Right. Like, Here's a guy who is courageous enough to express the weird, dark world that you know artists like you and I live in, right. and it was just incredible. And so, you know, that was big for me. And you know, in the years after, uh, I would go to Europe pretty often just to you know be really um, supplied with inspiration. And but you know, I had this like uh naturalist side to I wanted to paint, you know, realistically. And so I kind of waned with, you know, dark stuff compared to, you know, beauty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I probably dealt with an identity crisis all through that and just <laughs> like, realized it. And so uh, natural, you know, natural time in an artist's life. I think everyone kind of goes through that at some point when they're figuring out what they want to do. Yeah, yeah, even to this day, it's a struggle, like, you know, do I make something that's pleasant that I know will sell, or, right. <laughs> you know, am I compromising something in myself, and so, you know, uh, you know, and I think even just recently, like, when trying to consciously make comfortable work for sale, mm. uh, but also making work that I know that is me, right. and finding out that you know, collectors want me as my authentic self right. more than just trying to be comfortable. And so absolutely, that's, that's been a struggle career wise or, you know, just with working with galleries, like, you know, they have comfort levels too. Yeah. <laughs> you stepping out of that. And yeah. <laughs> seems like it's part of the human experience. Exactly. In every, you know, facet really. Um, yeah. So what uh what okay so you you I mean you've got art degrees, right? I do. I yeah. have a That's... bachelor and masters in painting. I only minored in sculpture, but uh I have art history degree as well. I mean so, so cool. Yeah, so I you know I I delved in the academic world. And you know, of course when you're done with that, you're like, "Oh crap." Go find a job. Go find a teacher job. Like, <laughs> that's what I was getting at. That's that's kind of why I asked. It's like, okay, you've got this amazing art education, and you've got art degrees now. What what how, what do you what happens next once you graduate? Yeah, um, you know, and I and I did it once. You know, I applied to art professor professor openings. Oh, and uh, you know. Didn't get any hits, and then I thought, well, I had a really great friend. Uh, this is when I lived in Hayes, Kansas, mm. you know, rural, rural America, <laughs> and I I became friends with this fantastic watercolor painter. His name was John Cody. He was considered the Audubon of moths, so he was a fantastic moth painter. Wow. <laughs> And this guy was like straight out of the old world. He was extremely intelligent. He went to Johns Hopkins. Wow. He wrote biographies on Emily Dickinson. And, you know, this guy was like 
incredibly intelligent yeah. and showed over to him and we would have just these wild conversations and you know that was just such a huge influence on me but you know he started with medical illustration hmm. so he's like why don't you apply at johns hopkins like the leading medical illustration school and i was like okay so i applied and i didn't get in because I was too much of an artist. And he said, <laughs> our program would bore you to death. And so, wow. <laughs> it was this, you know, it's just, it just seemed like I was trying as hard as I can to actually just be who I am. Right. And, you know, by the time um, 2004, 2005 had rolled around, I, you know, I started doing these sculpture things, you know, I had done it, you know, hit or miss in the nineties, mm. you know, you know, people really responded well, but I was like, Oh no, it's, this is, this is just fun. <laughs> that was you the know, key though. Just, you know, that was the key. And, and I had a friend who said, you know, why don't you do another one of those again? And it's like, okay. So I, I made one of these in like 2004 and, uh, you know, people loved it. I was like, well, okay. You know, I still got some parts left over. I'll make another one. <laughs> then one like that. I'm like, okay, I'm going big. And so then I made this seven foot tall skeletal piece. Yep. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm getting somewhere. Maybe, maybe I'm comfortable with this, you know? Uh -huh. um, yeah, around, yeah, it was in 2006 on my birthday. I was in a little cafe. I'd just gotten a nice little latte. Coming to sit down, my phone rings. <clears throat> and this guy named Brad, who was in this gallery in Philadelphia, he, you know, and I had all these kind of preconceived notions of what art galleries are like, you know. You, you hadn't know, been not, showing at that point or anything? Not really, you yeah. know, just this. You know, I figured, oh, it was probably a nice gentleman in a suit and, you know, and, <laughs> This guy, Brad, calls me. He's like, yeah, man, we like your shit. We want to show it. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, cool. And uh, so they had like, uh, this was the Lineage Gallery in Philadelphia in 2006. So mm -hmm. they had a group show where they just had, they had this beautiful uh, dis display area in, near down, old part of downtown Philadelphia. And so I... Packed up all my work in my minivan, and I drove it out there and hung it, and everything sold. Yeah. I had some paintings there, uh, but the sculptures that I made, like, I couldn't I couldn't even fathom it. Like, here I am driving on the highway, and Brad calls me, like, oh, yeah, we sold your sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> like, how does that work? How do you sell a piece before you show it on the wall? Like, I don't understand that. <laughs> Welcome to the art world. <laughs> yeah. And then... Um, it's amazing. Yeah, things started taking off in there, and there were other galleries that got interested. And then, like, you know, even at that early stage, I got to experience uh, what can be an unpleasantry between galleries fighting mm -hmm. over. Yeah. And so I experienced that, which, uh, you know, had... Uh, you know, had... A, pretty much has some effect on me. So, you know, there are points where you have to realize where your boundaries are, mm -hmm. where is respectable business. So that was, um, some big lessons to learn. Yeah. And I, fortunately I had that early on. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all part of the experience. Yeah. It sounds like you've, you've had a really, um, probably more than anybody on this podcast and we're up this is going to be episode 186 so mm. out of yeah out of all the artists i've interviewed you've probably had the most traditional uh you know old school traditional art career as far as you went to college you got a degree you got in a gallery and you just kind of like took off from there and you've kind of been in the gallery you know you're you're business is basically through the gallery system, right? 
Yeah. So it's yeah. very more it's more traditional than most people that I know, which is like, you know, galleries won't take our or take you know, take our stuff or we can't make enough in galleries, so we have to kinda hustle on the side. But you've been had that kind of um gallery career, which I'm so interested to hear about because it sounds like amazing to me, where you kinda like the gallery deals with everything and you just get to make art pretty much. I mean that sounds like heaven to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I still get uh, involved in, you know, some of the process, you know. I've had a few, like, big commission jobs where, you know, uh, I really had to do a lot of the legwork, too. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, I say that in my career, like, you know, definitely a lot of, like, unassumptive things have happened or opportunities come up or things I just never thought I would do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just been the gallery world part, you know, it's been like, you know, like I did a big project with the Marine Corps. Oh, really? I'd ever, you know, get involved in doing. And it was just surreal that, you know, these people approached me and said, well, we had a meeting at the Pentagon with the Marine <laughs> Commandant and we showed him some artists and he said, this guy, this is our guy. Amazing. Would you like to do this project? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, if anybody needs art, it's the Pentagon. Yeah. As far as and, kind of being know, like a subversive thrilled. influence. You know, it was, it was interesting what they told me because <clears throat> <laughs> the – the Marine Corps, you know, dealing with their company that handles all their advertising, they were like, hey, we want to be the Nike of the armed forces. Like, can you help us with that? And so this guy and their group of uh, directors at this firm was like, well, there's this guy we really like, you know. And, you know, I thought like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've done some things that might be offensive to the military. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know about this. Like, <laughs> like the church tanks. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, don't show them everything I've done. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, it ended up being a artwork that I made for a recruitment program. So every year the Marine Corps has a kind of recruitment poster mm-hmm. to just a, you know, as an advertising splash, like, right. you know. And so... I, you know, I made these three pieces and they were the most surveillance works I've ever made. Like I had to send them updates every two weeks to show everything I put on there. It had to be Marine related. Wow. I remember at one point I put 20 of these tiny little helicopters all over this piece and they're like, Hey, what are those helicopters doing on there? Like, those are Blackhawks. The Marines don't use those. Uh Oh, no way. Wow. I'm like, no, no, they're Seahawks. They're not Blackhawks. They're like, (laughs) oh, well, the Navy uses those more than we do. So just just go ahead and take those off. Wow. Oh, my God. That must have been difficult. (laughs) Yeah. And there was one piece where I actually built this beautiful model of the Pentagon. And I was going to use it as a backsplash. You know, I asked them first, like, you know, you think it'd be cool if, like, the Pentagon is kind of back here, hailing there? Like, oh, sure. So I put it on there. And a couple of days later, like, oh, yeah, the Pentagon isn't really a positive symbol of freedom. So do you think you could take that off there? Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just interesting, you know, trying to exist, you know, trying to be who I am and exist in that world. Yeah. Which is out beautifully, and so like they wanted the the three pieces I did at the Marine Corps Museum, and so I wow. I go there and get the pieces there, and I I've never been treated like such a rock star before. Like I, I was shocked. Like <laughs> you know, it's the 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 museum is nearby one of the training facilities, and so. There's all these like young Marines there, like seeing what I'm doing, and they're just flipping out. I'm like signing posters. And, wow. Like, Sir, it's not every day that you meet a great artist. 
It's so good to meet you, sir. <laughs> sir, it's great to meet you. And wow. Just, Different world, man. Like, yeah. And, um, we're used to being treated like shit by, by artists. We're <laughs> used to being treated by shit by like every segment of society. I know. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah, I was just shocked. I, I just figured like, you know, this might be the most unwelcoming area for an artist. But right. It kind of fell into my personal, you know, part of my personal belief is that as an artist, you should be where you are not supposed to be. Right. Yeah, yeah. You should be uncomfortable because to have that right influence, you have to influence the right people or things. Right. And I just, like, you know, this thing chose me. I never thought in a million years I would do something. And so it, it was great. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some months later, they send me this letter. They're like, hey, uh, you've been nominated for an award. Uh, we want to have you at this banquet. I'm like, okay. So I go there, and it's like a humanitarian awards that they give to people who did things for the Marines or wrote books. Or So I go there, and um, I meet these elite, power, powerful people there. And, you know, it's just it's so surreal to shake hands with people who have, like, ultimate control over just – unlimited use of armed forces and to just mingle with them and have casual talk. And they have this huge bar of like any kind of drink you could possibly want. So I'm just sitting there hobnobbing with huge heads of state. <laughs> you know, That's the crazy. Secretary is there talking and, you know, I mean, it's very formal and, you know, it was just surreal. Like, and but you know nothing but praise. You know I walk in, it's like Mr. Cooksey, did you know that in this museum that your sculpture is the second most photographed thing? You know what the most photographed thing is? What? The flag that flew over Iwo Jima. Oh my god! Wow. <laughs> like, That's incredible. Dude. Though. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's so, amazing! Wow, yeah, it seems like you're you you know I guess, I guess you've uh, I mean you've done other kind of work like that too commissioned work for like I don't know I, I read in your bio you've worked for Nike and or you've done stuff for Nike yeah. and stuff like that I mean it seems like you've yeah. had a like kind of a kind of a crazy career just really unusual and you're so like low key. You're like you're like a mellow, low key guy that just kind of goes, hmm, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try it. You know, I'm just, it's just yeah. like it's interesting. I don't know. It just seems like if you're, if you're not just like trying so hard to carve a certain path, life will take you in such other, more interesting ways if you kind of allow it to, if you're open to that. Yeah, yeah. I, that's that's what I love. I just love knowing these very interesting people. So, yeah, Mark Parker at Nike. He was the uh, CEO for a number of years. He's my by far my biggest collector. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember you doing at least – I remember him buying at least one of your pieces through Copro or hearing that you were doing some commission work for him, but I didn't realize yeah. he has a bunch of your stuff. Yeah, I think he owns about 14 or 15 of them. Wow. Holy shit. Yeah. So – yeah, in uh, late 2017, I big uh, I did a big piece for him. Uh, he just wanted the uh, the Nike the, the famous Nike statue that's at the Louvre, mm. just the one with no head or arms. It's just her wings. He just wanted something built around that. So I I made this huge elaborate piece, and uh, it was going to be for their new headquarters that they were building there up there in. Beaverton, Oregon, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah, that was that was a big, wonderful piece to do. Uh, it was funny when I delivered it. It was on one of the rarest days in Portland when it ever snows. Oh, weird! So <laughs> see Portland, what I mean? You got a weird life. <laughs> yeah, like here I am, this big giant piece rolling in, and the whole town is shut down. Like Portland doesn't know how to deal with snow. Right. The whole the whole town is shut down. And, and the Nike campus isn't even open. 
but you know, a few people were there. So I, you know, we bring it in. It's, it's too big for the elevator. So we have to go up the stairway and, and I, you know, I, I'm done with it early. Like, like the building isn't even built yet. So Mark's like, well, it's just hanging in my office. And so we hung it in the back of his office behind his desk. And it was great. It was really, you know, that was another piece that, you know, even though it was specific to something that I, you know, was had to do or, you know, never thought I'd really get an idea for that. But, you know, I didn't feel, you know, compromised in any way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I just didn't put anything that was a little too naughty on there. Right. <laughs> Tend to want to on just about everything I make, but. Do you, you know. do you, um, have you had experiences where it was really like a nightmare commit where what you were being directed so much that it was wrecking the whole thing or you felt like it was unpleasant or, or have you been, been able to keep kind of the autonomy? Yeah. I don't think it ever did. Of course I'm, I'm a pretty tolerant person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I can tell. <laughs> you know, somebody really berated me and you know, I just be polite, you know? Okay. But, you know, I, I never felt like the creative process to where it's like, you know, they're changing it so much or having so much input that it's like, I can't, I don't like this anymore or I can't finish it or, you know. Yeah, that, that's kind of what um, a lot of the gallery world doesn't like our commissions because, you know, if, you, if you're giving your client just too much uh, say over it, you know, it can, it can really go into, oh, you yeah. know, old parts. And so... Um, but you know, at the same time, it's a good gig, you know. It's, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> and so, you know, and I, 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 I know that there are changes in the art market. You know, I, I don't try to pay too much attention. You know, I, I don't want to get depressed about it. You know, I just, you know, as long as I can keep floating, then you know, I feel good. But you know, I, I never take it <clears throat> for granted. I, you know, doing this full time for 13 years, it's, uh, it's very challenging. And, you know, I don't, I don't get a steady paycheck every month. Right. You know, it's like, uh, the constant, you know, juggle of, you know, when, when is, uh, funds happening, you know, See, how I, I, that's, it's, I, I did, I, I, you know, maybe naively kind of expected that maybe you weren't in that position as much as most of us because your stuff, you know, as far as I know, your stuff has always commanded pretty good prices. You know, yeah. your stuff has never been cheap. It's not like you kind of went really cheap that I know of and worked your way up. It's like every time I've seen your stuff, it's had a pretty hefty and, you know, totally worth it, of course. But, you know, you're, you're getting what you're, work is worth whereas most of us are kind of like getting less than that it's actually worth because we're trying to climb our way up but um so and it seemed like you were always in demand you know i know trying to get you in shows that i curated was difficult because you were just always you're doing commissions or you're in whatever you, you know you're in demand guy so i just assumed probably you were you know you were you did not have that concern about when the funds were coming through but I guess yeah. we all do. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, you know, I, I, I can totally keep things going, you know, regardless. But, you know, in, in any kind of, you know, normalcy, you know, it's it's just nothing I can ever schedule. Right, you know? right, yeah. It's, you know, a, a big part of the year is getting ready for one show. That's right, so yeah. See, you have to figure out how to, like, how do you support everything – Right. You know, just on a living level, but, you know, how do you fund the show that's going to happen at the end of the year? Right. It's, it's yeah, a you, real... you had a, I, you know, hold on one second. I got to, sorry, everybody. Oh, man. Okay. My level was messed up. I'm going to have to fix that in editing. Sorry. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's a different lifestyle, though, for you being you know, being a gallery artist, it's different. It's like you're preparing for a show. Whereas, you know, somebody like myself that I don't, I don't make enough money from, I do a gallery show every year, except for the last couple of years. Cause I needed a break, but I don't make enough from the gallery sales to support myself. 
There's no way, not even close. So I'm like always got to do the hustle. And so I'm like, my, you know, selling stuff and, and prints and this and that. Uh, but it's a totally different trip when it's like you've got your art show and like you said, you've got a year and your stuff is so intricate and I'm sure it takes a long time to get these things done. It is a very long time. It's like, how? what's the average amount of pieces you do for a solo show? Is Do you have kind of an, a rough average? Uh, you know, if I can get it around, you know, eight to 10, like I feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, I'll always start more than that. But, you know, when it comes down to the final rush, you know, a, yeah. a couple make it. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it's been interesting seeing how the last few years the world exists and um you know there's, there's been a lot of galleries that have folded yeah and it's um you know i don't know if there's any you know i'm not a, a gallery analyst by any means so you know i imagine there's several factors at hand but uh you know sometimes um you know, it's it's an adapt or perish kind of thing. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think it's um, you know, it's it's something that you could just never take for granted, and um, just you know, do the best you can, and you know, just very fortunate and very um, excited to just keep doing and you know, people support you know what I want to do, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't think galleries will ever go away. I really don't. I mean, I know a lot of people say that because of online sales and direct sales, but <clears throat> I think it's just like uh, you know the music industry went to shit, but there's still you know there's still bands doing it. You know, it's always going to be there. There's still live. Sh- not now. There's not, but you know, with COVID. But um, you know. Uh, <clears throat> they'll always be there and it's and it's kind of like it, the question is which ones will survive yeah because you know, yeah. it's definitely a different landscape than it was gallery wise but it's just like copro you know they've managed to and they're like a, you know they they they're a you know seat of their pants kind of gallery always it's always a hustle as well and it's like they've been able to ride this whole thing out and somehow manage to make sales you know, by, you know, changing their model a little bit maybe and selling, doing more online sales and stuff like that. So there's a way to have an actual physical gallery and make it work. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> a good comment about the online thing is, you know, when I have a show, um, the, the pieces would sell to collectors through like an email blast. And so, you know, people would buy the work without – actually seeing it in person. Right. And, you know, I thought that was interesting that, you know, the opening is like the big hurrah. Like you go to the opening, there's lots of people, but then you'll find that none of the people there are the actual collectors. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody buys stuff at openings. It's like they buy it on the preview, the online preview, or after the opening, I found. I, I will have to say uh, a show I did in late 17 in New York uh, with my gallerist Joshua Liner, I made this wild Medusa piece, and he, uh, you know, he had different uh, opinion about it than I did because it was more an intensity look to it. Yeah, that was an amazing uh, piece. I've seen that. Yeah, but awesome. you know, it was the biggest piece in the show, and uh, you know, I, I could I could tell he had some concern about it, but during the opening. This uh, this guy comes in and he's got this nice suit on, older gentleman, and he just walks up to it and he's just staring at it. And, uh, and he goes down. <laughs> yeah, I talk to my friend and he's like, "No, nah, I think that guy is gonna buy it." And I'm like, "Well, I don't know about that. Like, you know, how often do you get like a walk-in sale on opening night?" Right. <laughs> And, you know, it's the, the most expensive piece. And, uh, and sure enough, the guy buys it. <laughs> so and, uh, awesome. You know, I just end up, he's just like talking my ear off the whole night. And I'm like, man, this guy's great. Like, wow. 
No, thank you so much. Like, it's totally unexpected. Like, you look at him, this nice suit. Yeah, I think he was uh, for, uh, he was involved, I think he was a Wall Street banker, I think, Merrill Lynch or something. Wow. And uh, he's just like, yeah, I love it. And, you know, and he's showing me his other art collection and, you know, and he, he ended up getting it. And it was just, you know, it's just another, uh, I, you know, hold on a second. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, my son Owen uh, <clears throat> said he was getting hungry. So, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I'm surprised I haven't gotten a knock yet on the board. <laughs> so, but, uh, so, what what was this other guy's collection like? Was was it anything uh, near what you do, or was it a totally he, different his, trip? Yeah, his thing was uh, he loved. Um, like religious Catholic kind of art. And he was showing me um, these artists that he knew that were doing these beautiful things for him. And he told me about this beautiful church that's in New York with this amazing Archangel Michael statue there. And mm. so, you know, we're just talking up a storm and, you know, like, and this guy bought my Medusa piece. Like, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that That same guy... Uh, asked me this last fall to make uh, a piece for him, a commission piece about the end times. Wow! <laughs> and, Sounds perfect. Uh, this was this was pre-COVID. Amazing. And here I am. Uh, I think I finished it in May, and I'm like, you know, this this uh, scene of the end times where you have Archangel Michael weighing souls and I made this beautiful hell landscape down below and wow. there's a heavenish area. You know, I, I haven't really shown it yet. Like I feel like, you know, at some point I need to here soon because it's just so completely. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, that, that was, that was a great, uh, yeah, that, that's the sort of thing where, you know, getting collectors, you know, from a show that you've done, it's just, you know, it, it ends up being a good thing in the long run. So Yeah, yeah. Again, another weird thing to happen to you. I swear, you, you just seem like you have all so many weird things happen to you. Like, I, I, weird, I have, auspicious things happen to you. Yeah, like, I, I have an even weirder stuff. Uh, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this last year, I... I don't know how much of this I can actually share, but um, I was a part of a uh, like finalist selection of artists that um, I didn't know that I was aware of mm -hmm. until this gentleman contacted the gallery, Josh, and said that I was one of 15 of this finalist for this uh, very interesting project. And so I had to do this um, big uh, submission paper. So I had to put together this huge presentation <clears throat> of just past uh, experiences and you know interesting projects that I've done. Mm. So I ended up being a finalist, like one of four people. And so we were invited to this very remote location in Texas. Uh, on this huge ranch and we got to go inside this giant mountain and look at something that was just utterly fantastic. And, um, so it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a part of a, um, kind of a competition for an art piece that would be made for this event. And so the, <laughs> the, uh, they call them the client, the client was the person who was funding this whole thing and putting it all together. And uh, so into that elimination process, I got to go meet the client at his Seattle home. Uh -huh. And that was, uh, that was September of last year. And yeah, so uh, I won't. Yeah, who, 
who it was, but <laughs> somebody famous, I imagine. Like. Been one of the foremost characters in the planet right now. Okay. I was <laughs> chatting with him about this project, and so that was pretty surreal. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> like I said, you you just I, uh, I, <laughs> it's a trip. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's what. You know, that's what that's what happens when you've got you've got you've got a good thing going. You've got this, you know, amazing uh 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 I don't know, your own genre of sculpture. It's like you kind of created this thing. I remember when I first saw your first pieces, I you know, the first thing I thought of was like that motherfucker. <laughs> it's like that is such a good idea. Ah, it's like, I wish I thought of it. It's so, it's such a brilliant idea. It's like one of those things. Every once in a while, you'll see something like that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Like, you'll see someone come up with just a, an idea, and it's just like, ah, it's so, it's just, it's one of those amazing ideas. And, yeah. um, <clears throat> and it's like, I would so, it, you know, it makes me want to do one. It's like, I want to do one, but I could never do one because no one should ever do one. And I know people have kind of like done them, <laughs> you know, there's been people that have kind of bit your style somewhat, but, the, but it's like, yeah. you, you were the first to show it. You were the first to come up with the idea and have it be seen. It's yours. No one can, you know, no one, no one should ever try anything like that. Because it's it's yeah. so specifically you and so signature that it's like you kind of own it. So, but it's 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 it, it it's inspiring and frustrating at the same time because it's like you I want to make one. It looks like it'd be so much fun to make one, but I I would never do it. I would never do it because yeah. I would never I would never feel right about it. I would never feel right about showing it. You know, it's yours. So yeah, I really appreciate that. I mean, and, and that's another part of the career here is, is dealing with uh, those who want to copy, you mm -hmm. know, like I feel like that should be included. in as far as the indications that you've made it is when people start copying. You. Definitely. And, and, you know, in my experience, it hasn't just been people. It's been like, you know, other things mm -hmm. like things. Yep. And so the you know learning process um and just the you know you know how to navigate through that because you know it can feel very uh uncomfortable and, yeah <laughs> you know, i i definitely don't want to get into any kind of specifics about any of those but right right no, uh, no, definitely it's not. it's been really you know it's, it's all lesson learned and you know, and I, and I think for artists, like, it's very important to, uh, you know, have a sense of ownership of, over what you do, you know, not only just stylistically, but, you know, even on the, you know, uh, side of, you know, when it comes to copyrights, like, those kind of things, it's mm -hmm. always have those things in place, too, because that that's what ultimately helped me with dealing with some of these things. And so, you know, that isn't always, that's not taught in art school, you know? Right. Yeah. It's not, um, you know, it's, you know, I, I've seen <clears throat> a lot of artists, some artist friends, you know, put into these compromise positions. And so it's like, well, you got to get this, this in order because, you know, to deal with the real world is, you know, it's not forgiving. And right. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been very interesting. I mean, and even in my case, uh, some of these things turned out to be so much of a win-win. Again, it's just another strange, surreal thing. Like, you know, <laughs> how did I even get here? Uh, sitting here with famous people and almost colliding with Julia Roberts. You know, right. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> How I got here, but. Yeah, <laughs> I almost a... to Julia Roberts and <laughs> beautiful red dress. And anyway, I'll tell you more in private. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, no problem. Um, so you know, when you did that first sculpture piece that you were messing with, the one that your friend told you to do another one, 
How did you how did you have all that stuff lying around already? Or did you like did you yeah. have an idea to make a sculpture and then go on eBay and buy a bunch of model old model parts or how did that come about? Yeah, that's the part of me that so in my adolescence, my total nerd geek thing to do was to build models. Build, Same here, man. You know, my my thing was like airplanes, uh Jets, rockets, you know, I didn't, I didn't care too much for like car models. Like I felt like that was too cliche. So <laughs> man, I just, I just loved vehicles. I just love forms and shapes. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of never went away. And so when it came to art, you know, it's like, I just, I would collect all this stuff, you know? Right. And it just kind of came to where like, I, I had it was, this was 1995. I had a summer painting class, and I had all this stuff, and I just like you know why don't I just use this as a canvas? And so I I took the tabletop of a like a metal lawn set. It was very ornate and decorative, and I attached these. Uh, cow jawbones and this deer skull too mm -hmm. and then I had these wedding cake decoration things and I just made this beautiful arrangement like just totally on a whim mm -hmm. and you know so my thing was that sorry okay. my thing was that well this can't just be a, a sculpture it's for a painting class so I have to paint it and so I painted this thing and oh, wow. <laughs> turned it in and That's my so teacher funny oh, wow, that's interesting. And, um, but, you know, again, I didn't, I didn't take it seriously, but, you know, it took, it took a good decade to catch up to me. And so it was, yeah, it was just something left over from. It was just reference. You were creating a reference piece to make a painting, right? Yeah. It, <laughs> it's it, hilarious. <laughs> it just dawned on me that, you know, I'm a builder. I like to build yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, for all the love that I have for painting and technique and just, you know, just, you know, it just felt like I felt more of myself, mm -hmm. you know, using three dimensional space. So, totally. yeah. And I, I, I still paint every now and then, you know, I'll do like a, uh, an, a painting of an iris or paint somebody's portrait. And so I, you know, I feel like that never leaves me or right. I use it. Uh, but yeah, you know, at the same time, it's like, I don't want it to be about ego. Like I don't want to have to prove to everybody right. how good of a painter I am just, right. just to prove it. You know? Right. Right. Like that's not the purpose of it. You've and got so, paintings on your website. So if anybody wants to know what a badass painter you are, they can go. Look. <laughs> you don't, I mean, <laughs> but, but yeah, the fact that they're acrylic, like acrylic, those is, are acrylic. Those are acrylic. Oh my acrylic god! Are hard. <laughs> it's hard to but, do that with them. That's for sure. Yeah, and so that's crazy. You know, a part of me was like, well, my my high school art teacher and my college professor were both allergic to oil paint, and so I never I never got to paint with oil paint. It was like only acrylic. Wow! And so I was just kind of by default learned to paint with acrylic wow. now like in later years i went to europe and learned old master painting techniques you know that was a lot of fun yeah kind of use that towards acrylic but you know i've, I've never done just a full-on oil painting and i think like really you know i i feel like i've totally missed out on a whole other world that maybe i should be doing so well you should do it for fun anyway yeah, just to, I'll, just, come, uh, I'll come visit you and you give me some lessons. Totally. I would, <laughs> I would love to do that. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you know, you're, um, uh, I, I see you as like a true artist. Like you're a real true artist to where you, you kind of excel in whatever medium you, you're, you're, you're able to excel in, in any kind of medium within the art world or in the art realm, kind of like Christopher Ulrich is, is like this. I don't know if you know, Christopher, yeah. Yeah. he's kind of like that. Like he's, he's amazing with his paintings are amazing. He does acrylic paintings that are amazing. He does these marker sketches. They're just like, 
they're so good in sketchbooks and drawings. It's like he's kind of and he does toys and it's like he's just, it's just like certain people that are I think I don't know I, I I think of them as like you know real artists. They they can kind of you, you could put them in a room full of just a bunch of junk and they could turn that into some amazing thing. You know what I mean? It's like it's more the way you. I think the way you view the world, like you're always looking at looking at things through a creative lens. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. You know, so I, you know, I just, I, I, I have a feeling like if you, I don't know, got into music or were interested in music, you'd probably be able to, you know, learn how to. I, I don't know if you play or not, but you probably. Uh, that I was gonna mention that earlier. <laughs> actually, uh, actually, uh, got a guitar in my teenage years. And I, I ended up getting on kind of the same caliber as like a, a '80s uh, metal shredder kind mm -hmm. of. Ingvay Malmsteen was like my mm -hmm. <laughs> guitar hero, so I actually delved in that world. Right. But I'm I'm I don't have the brain to learn songs verbatim. Like I, all I could do. In a disciplinary sense, and that was just to be completely improvisational. That's a trip. That's unusual. So I would just like find some sick drum beat that you know lasted thirty minutes, and I would just play along with that, <laughs> just shred up and down scales, and just wow. get into it. so. And no way am I any kind of proper functioning musician, right? Right. That far, but. I guess the point I was getting to is that, you know, I think, I don't know, you seem like you have one of the, those kind of minds that if you're interested in something, you're able to learn it and at least become adequate at it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. When it, it comes to create creative things. <clears throat> yeah. It's a big um, hurdle to stop your own self-limitations mm -hmm. because, um, you know, that's a struggle I, I deal with sometimes is, you know, I have to do this, you know, at this proximity to this caliber. And I, you know, it can, you know, to look at nothingness and put together a show of eight to 10 pieces, you know, that's such a huge difference between that very raw beginning where I feel so completely uh, clueless to refining something. Right. And, you know, it's just like picking up a huge book and starting to read it. Like the amount of dread of work just to do that. Right. It's hard. So, you know, just being, you know, completely unafraid and right. not getting to, to start something is, you know, I, I, I think that's just how you have to be. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a, I think, I think that's, I think that's a, a, a problem you have. Like you said, it's like a, a late, a late career or a later career pro problem that comes up, you know, like having expectations and wondering, can I keep doing this? And is this one going to, is this show going to suck? You know, because if you're just kind of going on your own intuition, you know, you, you, you can, it's just like, you know, uh, you know, you always hear of bands that put out albums. Um, I was watching that Rush documentary the other night again, you know, cause I'm, I'm like a Rush fan and uh -huh. it's on uh, I think it's on Netflix and they were talking about how they did this album, like an early album in their career, like their third album or something. And it just completely bombed and they loved it. You know, when they did it, they were completely inspired um, and you could tell they were sort of making excuses for it. Like they were smoking too much weed at the time, maybe, but, <laughs> but they were like, we were, it's actually, it's a really good album and it's, and it's just, you know, you, these things, um, once you have a career, you have to, it's, they come up, they shouldn't come up, but they do come up. Like, can I do this again? Or are my, you know, I had one show where I was like, I don't have any, I, I can't, I don't know if it was, I think it was exhaustion maybe from working too hard. I just couldn't come up with ideas. And, it, and it, I just couldn't do it. I was like, it was the first, my one and only time I had like a block. And I ended up, what I ended up doing is just kind of like 
relaxing and then looking at um, old horror comics from the 50s and 60s. I found these books online, and, and that for me when I was a kid was very inspiring. So just looking at them kind of got me going again, and I was able to do a whole show. But um, yeah, or just you know changing things up wanting to try new things and not knowing if they're going to land or not. I got, sorry about yeah. the, I got a gardener out fucking, I, <laughs> I don't know if you could hear that. There's like a leaf blower outside. So the, the real world creeps in. Yeah. I'll try and uh, get rid of that in the record on the uh, editing process, but you know what I'm saying though? I mean, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm saying. There's just different, yeah. there's different in different stages of your career. There's different, different problems come up. It's not, it's like, there's never not a problem. It's just the problem changes. (laughs) It's like problems are inherently built into every aspect of life. It seems like. Yeah, they definitely are. Um, yeah. And I think back of all the, you know, shows I've done like the, cause you know, I live in the middle of nowhere and I have to, I have to get this to the coast. Yeah. How do you do that? (laughs) What do you do? A lot lot of times I would end up just driving my show in a u-haul that's and, right you know that that can't be done in just a couple of hours that's like 20 plus hours yeah you did that to, you did that for the for a copro show yeah yeah not many times um and you know it's like once you get there like you're completely exhausted but i was like okay let's hang a show yeah. so. <laughs> it's kind of a cool if you could, if you're getting, I guess if the question is if you're getting paid enough, it would be kind of a cool part of the, pro- I could see it being part of a cool part of the process. Like this is my work. It has to be hand delivered. I have to hang it and I'm making good money and I can hire people to load it and I can kind of, you know, just travel across the country when I make a sale and take a little cool little road trip, hang the thing. You know what I'm saying? It seems like that would yeah, be kind exactly. of a fun aspect of, of it, really. Yeah. As long as you're getting paid enough, because <laughs> because if you're doing something like that and you're not and you're struggling to make ends meet and you have to worry about stuff like that and try and do every single aspect of it yourself, that seems like it would be a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, and I think back like, you know, that would have been incredibly stressful and just hard to deal with, and but at the same time, like. It was such an adrenaline rush too, mm-hmm. you know, something about like, you know, being pushed to the edge, like, you know, you really, you really show up, you know, as a right, person, yeah. you really like take charge and it's like some kind of adrenaline high. It's mm-hmm. like some, kind of, and, um, you know, that's very different from just sitting in your studio quietly, listening to some music, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so it's it's interesting, like what you can find out about yourself, put into, you know, situations that aren't comfortable. Yeah, or staying or, you know, yeah. I'm in my late forties now. Like, you know, I can't drive to the coast in one shot anymore. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, without you know, substantive aid, but you know, <laughs> I love driving though, and right, you know, I've seen some really interesting things on drives and travels and you know it's just one of those delightful things to you know experience you know i I always felt like and a lot of great writers have talked about this how travel is so important Mm -hmm. you know gets you out of your comfort zone because you know being contained in this this is comfort um but yeah i just i love traveling and meeting new people Mm -hmm. You know, I think from the kind of people I know, like there are such extreme ends, right? <laughs> each other that you know, uh, I, I think it's just wonderful. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's everybody should travel. I, I don't, <clears throat> I don't like traveling anymore because I did it a lot early in my career when I was working on movies. I had the same situation as you. Like, I'd never been on a, I've never even been on a plane before, and I got a job. When I was eighteen, and they and I they flew me to Italy for three months, <laughs> <laughs> and I just had gotten in the business and I was making molds for this place. And they were like, "You want to go to Italy?" Oh, okay. And um, 
and so it's like a 20 whatever hour flight but um and then i ended up going to china working in china and traveling all over the country going to different states for jobs over time and i was never really into traveling because uh, i'm such a homebody i really am like you know i if i don't care if i never travel again ever like if i never leave my house <laughs> pretty much but um but because I feel, you know, I got what um, I got out of it, what you, what traveling gives you, which is you, yeah. know, you realize that all people are the same. All people are generally cool and just don't want any problems, you know, j- as far as like cultures in different parts of the world and stuff. Generally, sure. people are good, you know, it's and that's a huge thing to to experience, to see that, you know. Hey, I've been to this country and people are just generally pretty cool. And then I went to this other place that's, you know, thousands of miles away and people are pretty cool there too. And then I went to this other place where, you know, they people have this bad reputation, but they're actually just kind of cool, regular people. And it's like, uh-huh. oh, yeah. the whole world's like this. <laughs> you know, this is I've been lied to my whole life. But anyway, it's it's so valuable. Um, and I and I think that people who travel a lot seem to seem to generally have like a more optimistic outlook on on um the nature of humans you know yeah they seem yeah, to be definitely. kinder people maybe um so i th- yeah i think it's it's really a, a thing that i i think if everybody traveled around the world it would definitely be a better place put it that way yeah <laughs> so, yeah and it just goes to you know where i came from because i i could have easily fallen into that you know, right. Ne- never leave your nest kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and to, to go to very different places in the world, you know, culturally, like to go to, uh, a place that, you know, isn't, isn't a developed nation, uh, isn't, doesn't have, um, a social system that's, you know, mm-hmm. consider acceptable or, you know, to be put there, uh, to just, you know, you kind of meet yourself in your own discomfort. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that's very valuable. Oh, and yeah. It really makes, really makes you appreciate everything. And just, you know, sometimes you just need that kind of experience to realize that, you know, you know things aren't as bad as that you want to make them right. to be. You know, yeah, like, I know. It's it's a uh, it's you know it's a weird um, being being like a liberal. It's kind of weird to travel and then come back and say America is really you know one of the greatest countries in the world. It really you know generally speaking, it's it's great because when you go to other places and you you see it, but that's such a like a right wing talking point that you feel kind of weird saying it <laughs> as a liberal. But it's true, you know, you, you come back and you're like, you appreciate all these amazing things you have that you just take for granted all the time, you know, when you go and see people that don't have shit, you know, that have nothing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think it was interesting being in uh, Berlin and going to the little uh, Turkish food place at the end of the corner. Mm-hmm. Going in there, you know, Turkish guy making falafels, and you know, he looks at me. He realizes that I'm American, and with what little English he knows, he looks at me and he goes, "George Bush or Bill Clinton?" <laughs> <laughs> that is, <laughs> that's so funny because as soon as you said Berlin, I was gonna say I went to Berlin. I had a show in Berlin. At Strychnine Gallery. I don't know if that's yeah. why you you probably yeah. weren't. It's were you at Strychnine? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I went there, had a show, and it was during Bush, during uh-huh. the Bush era, and uh, frequently people wouldn't talk to me. Like especially, we went to this bar. It was like a local bar. The the bar owner and the people working there, they just wouldn't even. They wouldn't take your order. They wouldn't look at you. They wouldn't talk talk to you. And I was. And I was trying to be like nice, like I always am to pe- new people I meet. And Yasha was like, "Oh, they're not going to talk to you. Don't even try," because <laughs> they were just like. And then people at the show, I remember, were like, "Why did you elect this guy? 
you know, they couldn't understand it. And I was like, I didn't do it. <laughs> and it's, and you know, looking at, look at things now, it's like, you know, yeah, they're probably yeah. thinking we're complete psychopaths at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and a lot of times, um, you know, in situations like that, you know, um, you don't always know, like, you know, how they view you, right. they, you know, there might be that kind of assumptive, like they don't want anything to do with you. But I've also experienced where people feel intimidated because they wish they knew how to speak English more. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So it would, uh, you know, you could see some kind of shyness, but you might right. interpret it so like they don't want anything to do with you. And so that's true. That's true. But yeah, uh, I, I was going off of what Yasha said. She was yeah. like, "Oh yeah, they don't like Americans here." <laughs> it was like a, it was it was a Bush thing. It was, you know. I have to say, one of the most interesting things experience in Berlin was um, uh, Yasha took me to this place called Panorama Bar, uh-huh. and it's like this club in this like warehouse building, and you know, it was like one of the off nights. It wasn't a theme night. But, you know, it's just packed full of people and, you know, there's just like interesting things happening around you. You know, people are like, you know, very much in contact and, you know, I, I think I ended up drawing some pictures on this woman's arm <laughs> and, you know, just a throbbing techno beat. Uh -huh. and, you know, it's like asking where the bathroom is, like, oh, it's that way. And so heading there and there'd be this giant eight by 10 foot picture of this woman's crotch, just like <laughs> her legs open, like, you know, and I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. But, <laughs> you know, like the cultural context of this is normal. Right. It coming from Kansas, like I'll never see this again in my life. But, you know, <laughs> I have to take this in. Like, right. I would never see something like this again. And right. I, you know, I remember speaking of, of that period, um, Yasha took me to some party, like some like rich people's party thing. It was, and I, you know, I'm from like, not a, not a rural area, but it's, I'm from a blue collar town, San Pedro, which is like, you know, sail, sailors and longshoremen. That's what you did. You're, you know, if you grew up there, you're, you became a longshoreman. Um, so, I, you know, I'm blue blue collar person. Yeah. Uh, and so, <clears throat> you know, I'm in Berlin, which is crazy. And then she's like, oh, we're going to go to this party. I think there's maybe art collectors there or something. And we get up there. It's like this modern building, you know, super modern, like apartment building. And we go up to the door it's like all the everything's different like the door handles are different the the size of the doors are just different than i'm used to you know it's like a weird it's 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 europe and it's our like super rich part of europe so everything just seems even crazier but it was it was like you see in a movie there was a guy standing there in a black suit you know no tie all black like this tough guy standing letting people in and she's like i don't know gives him a card or tells him a code and then he lets us in the door and it was i'm telling you it was just like a movie it was like you walk in i could see i see it like a like a um what do you call those the the uh, like uh the 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 camera rigs that they wear where it's like really fluid they use oh, yeah. in movies. Uh, I can't think of it. You, people don't know what I'm talking about. But um, I see it that way. Like, you know, you walk in, there's a like a model, some beautiful model right here. You walk past, there's a guy holding out literally a, a velvet, uh, a piece of velvet with a bunch of diamonds. And he's showing someone else like this jeweler with these really huge diamonds and people over here playing backgammon. And it was just so like. It was just like in a movie, and everyone was just like super. You could tell it was, it was a world that I'd never um, experienced before in my life. It was like the ultra rich lifestyle yeah. partying, and it was like, wow, this was, it was so weird. Wow, it was a mind blower. <clears throat> but I think I think one other interesting kind of party experience I had uh, was during our Basel in 2012. Uh, so the Dutch designer, Iris Van Herpen, 
she's huge. Mm. Uh, her and I, in the years before, got acquainted, you know, and she um, she was at Art Basel, and the Met Museum wanted to throw a little party for her. <laughs> so she got to invite some artist friends. So we're at this kind of really nice schnazzy like restaurant club in Miami and we go there and we meet her just a few of us but we have our own table mm. it's a big table and at the end of the table is this giant water tank and we're sitting there I'm sitting next to Harold Coda who is the Met fashion curator <laughs> we're just talking up a storm you know real nice guy and then this woman in this crazy dress that Iris had designed, it was like some recent dresses, mm -hmm. this woman gets into this tank and is swimming around in this tank while we're sitting there having dinner. And it was just so surreal that this woman just yeah. swimming. And, you know, the she had a bit of wardrobe malfunction happening. But <laughs> this is Miami. Nobody cares. Right. And so we're sitting there eating, and pretty soon this guy comes around and offers to massage your shoulders <laughs> while you're eating. So, like, oh well, that's fun, you know. <laughs> and then this woman comes around with a bottle of liquor, and she just offers to pour it directly into your mouth, like a shot. That's just so weird. So. Getting this nice shoulder <laughs> massage and a shot being poured into my mouth. And there's this woman swimming around in the tank. And and then uh, she had asked, Iris had asked this famous cake maker to make a cake version of my church tank. So they brought that out for dessert. Whoa. With sparklers shining everywhere. Wow. And, That's amazing. Yeah, it was just it was just such a surreal, decadent yeah. evening that you know just hard to explain. Like you know, how do you go home at night and somebody asks you how your evening was and you tell them all that? You know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you know that's this is another uh, trippy thing about you. My perception about you, I think it's true, is that you are you know I consider you like. Uh, you know, a colleague and a friend and we're like from the same scene kind of, you know, yeah. but you have managed to, or, you know, just your artwork has taken you to this other level of fine art that I haven't, I haven't experienced it. You know, like I said, the stuff with Yasha is probably the closest thing I've ever had to experiencing that. But, but, um, so you are, you kind of are like one of us that made it made it to like the real art high-end art level which is so rare you know i can't think of anybody else i really know that i consider a friend that has gotten there you know so it's a trip so you're kind of like a hero i think to a, a lot of us in that way that you like you did it you broke through and you and you and you stayed cool and dark with your work <laughs> you know you didn't like do some cutesy thing or some trendy thing it's like you made your own you did your your own uh hundred percent your own thing and and created like created your own your own i mean niche doesn't really uh i, I don't think describes describes it well enough but you almost created your own genre of art in a weird yeah. way yeah. And made it, and it took you, and it's taken you to the, like these high levels to where you're, you know, hobnobbing with these Met people, and it's and it's it's so cool. Like I, I'm, I'm really happy that you're. That I'm happy that that uh, one of us was able to do it because there's. I feel that there's so much more, and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like there's so much more talent at at the. At, at the low levels that we're at, as far as like the greater art scene, I feel like there's, you know, maybe not more, but I don't, maybe there, it just seems like there's at least the same amount of talent, if not more than there is at the high levels. Yeah, I would you know? agree. And um, it all gets overlooked. 
And then once in a yeah. while, someone like you manages to break through, and it's so cool because you still have like a connection to us slowly, you know, dark art people <laughs> down here. <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you. Like, you know, there's some phenomenally fantastic, talented people that, you know, I wish were more noticed, more collected. And, right. You know, but, it, but it's hard to put that into any kind of text you know, of like, uh, judgment or, you know, like yeah. I can still, I can still be hard on myself for not, you know, doing more or right. doing this or that. And so like, I can definitely still feel like, what the hell am I doing in life? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> right. so, you know, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I just, I don't, I mean, I would love to, you know, have more in the material sense, but you know, it's not, that has never been a driven factor. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I want to have a nice comfortable living, you know, I have a couple of children, you know, just trying to keep a lid on everything. Um, but you know, at the same time, it's, it's been a great thing to do all these wildly strange experiences and you know like i've got that guy's phone number on my phone right exactly it's, it's amazing i could text him and you know yeah i mean that's so cool it's so cool i just I, it's just amazing but, but at I, the same time it's like you know the the transient guy downtown it's like i know him and we right, talk i know he tells me about the hiding spot that he lives where nobody can find him and nobody bothers right. him. <laughs> yeah, you're like one of those people, I think. You're just kind of like, you're open and non-judgmental, I guess. And so, you know, when those opportunities arise, you're able to, I don't know, you're able to, to relate to people because you're not, you know, yeah, a judgmental I, kind of person. I, I think it's a big thing to look at all the falsities and things, you know, yeah. um, I mean, a, a, the big thing with social media is that there's a lot of like false, deceptive perceptions going on, and it's hard for people not to get wrapped up in their own personal story through social media. Right. And, so, uh, and you know, as artists, we really cling to that kind of presence and such, and. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it doesn't always reflect reality. And I think it's, uh, you know, it can be a great thing and also be, you know, negative in some aspects. And so, you know, when you, like when I look at myself, like I think of all these amazing things that I've done here and there, but then I think I'm not as present here or there as maybe one should think that you should be. But right. I, I think that uh, I, I can't be too concerned about all that. And I think it all just leads into this tunnel of unhappiness or, um, you know, a false sense of who you are. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, we as artists have to let go of so much. And because it's ultimately, you know, who you are as a person that needs to to come out. And so... You know, I could easily judge myself in my career with a bigger artist, right? And faster, and that's you true. Know, yeah, making more money and more, sulk about it. Yeah, more. They're more prestigious. They got in this other museum that I've never been in. It's kind of never ending. I think. Yeah, and so you know, it's it's hard to you know steer clear of that, but you know, I think um, it's all about you know, what you experience in life and the people you meet and, you know, just mm. to have those opportunities to see this one thing at one time. I have to say one of the most unique experiences I've ever had was, you know, just unart related, but just the right there at the right time kind of thing is I was in Paris in 2009. I'd just flown in from Rome. I'm in a taxi at a stoplight. And I look over, and I see a woman with two heads. And one head looks at me, 
And then the other head looks at me. Oh, my God. I'm like, wow. And then right then, the taxi pulls away. <laughs> I just saw a woman with two heads. And I looked her up. And I found out, sure enough, it's a woman. At the time, she was like a late teenage year. I, I noticed these other young ladies around her kind of look similar. And sure enough, there I, I don't remember her name, but right. there was a woman. She's American. She has two heads. Like very Siamese identical twin heads. kind of thing. Yeah. And at the time, uh, one head had the natural blonde hair and the other one had colored it. So I oh, distinctly wow. remember both heads having two different colored hair. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's one of those things that, you know. <laughs> Just the timing and the car and then <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. I don't know. I feel like you attract that sort of thing somehow. You know, you just. Yeah. I think maybe something. I don't know. You you you've been. It's weird to say you've been blessed because you had. It sounds like you had a a, a kind of a difficult childhood in a lot of ways, or not, not an ideal childhood. Not that many of us had, but I mean, it sounded pretty. Yeah, you know, and, you know, and very. It's you know, it's very relevant to the current political environment because so much of my family were are such Trump lovers. Wow! And to know that, uh, you know, I chose not to be a part of that, or yeah, just to experience the level of political divide nowadays you know it's such a such a challenge and you know it's, it's such a hard thing to like you know we're not always blessed with the experiences that you know some of us get to have and you know it's, it's hard to think that here i am starting my own family but yet i've been completely ostracized from my family i came from right to think that, um, you know, to to deal with loss, but yet all these beautiful, wonderful things as well. Yeah. It's, it's really, you know, that's life, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing. It's amazing that you've done that. It's really the, you know, it's like a heroic thing to come out of that and then have, like, an amazing career, making amazing art, it's adding amazing, something amazing to the world and then having a family and raising kids and not making sure they don't go through what you went through. It's like, you know, you were like a mutation. It's like you were like a mutation sort of, you know, you didn't, you, you say you, you could have gotten wrapped up in that path, but I can't imagine you being that way. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost it's, like you, you know, there's part of you that was like, I can't, I can't do this. It, yeah. And that's like that, that weird mutation that happens, you know, this little twist of something in your brain that makes you not follow, not follow, you know, every, cause most people kind of, they, they do with their, the, how they were raised. That's how, that's the way yeah. they go their whole yeah. life, you know? But it's, it's hard at the same time having empathetic view of it, you know, like, you know, I wish I could have some influence on my family in that sense mm -hmm. without resistance. But it's almost at the same time, like, uh, you know, is it worth trying to, you know, cause that upheaval just to right. get that? You know, is it worth, you know? Or will it even, is it even possible? Yeah. I mean, that, that goes. It doesn't even to, seem possible nowadays, really. Yeah. That goes back to the social media thing and, mm -hmm. and you know, the, uh, the false realities there. Yeah. But, but, you know, just to have come from that and to see their perspective and understand them, like, you know, I get it. But. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> you must have a different perspective on I, – because, I mean, I was talking to my wife the other day. It's like I cannot figure – I can't understand it. I feel like I can't understand what's going on now. It's like I don't – like anybody, anybody that would, you know – I have been very non-political on the show. I don't really want to get into politics because I know people hate it because I hate it. I hate seeing it. But I have to just say this, just because of this uh, unique position you're in to be able to understand that. 
like if if I saw my guy up there blatantly doing like the most heinous shit, the you know being a total asshole. I mean, these are just like common sense things you're raised. Don't be a total asshole to people. Acting like an asshole, lying and getting caught repeatedly over and over. How, I I feel like I couldn't. I couldn't keep cheering, you know. Maybe I would be like, "Eh, okay, he's he's getting an agenda." I agree with, but I wouldn't be like, "Yeah, he's fucking great. I love it when he's a total asshole. I love it when he's just fucking lying constantly." I don't understand that. I can't. It completely blows my mind. I don't know how to comprehend it. So maybe I, you can help me. <laughs> I, I think it has to do with you know. We as humans by nature should always be bettering ourselves. We should always strive to be better people. Mm -hmm. When something like this happens, someone of big significance tells you, oh, no, you don't. You just be your laziest, <laughs> you know, self that you can be and it's okay. All right. Because all those things, that's all comfort. That's interesting, yeah. And people will defend their comfort zone to whatever means, beyond logical means, beyond family respectful, friend respectful boundaries, because they have somehow made up this thing that they're under attack. Right. And, you know, it's people want to, you know, calibrate themselves against others. If I can see that they're being oppressed, then I'm feeling better as right. long as I'm oppressed. And that's the sad part of it because that's complete illusion. Right. You, know, you can't you can't, you know, judge yourself against somebody else in that sense because it's just all made up story. Right. As my grandmother would say, that's all make believe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's kind of perfect. <laughs> That's a deep thing. It's funny. It's like there's probably an off offhanded comment. A real. It was like a simple way of her just kind of like under, trying to you know just her commentary. She just, on, she just bring me back to reality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, oh boy, Chris, he's he's uh, he's in trouble there. He's getting too wrapped up in his fantasy world. Yeah, but it's so it's so it so applies though now, especially in this situation. It's all. It's just. It's just make believe. It's yeah. Hilarious. Well, okay. Listen, I know you got to go soon, but I, I wanted to get into this before I let you go. Um, I I'm a total uh, process technical freak. I love hearing about process and and stuff. So I just wanted to get at least a little bit before before we end the podcast of your um your your technique for these sculptures. I mean, are you like? Do you draw them out? Do you just like get a bunch of stuff and start arranging it? You know, how planned out is it? How improvisational is it? How are you gluing things down to where they don't break? You know, stuff like that. I'm kind of curious about yeah. if you're open to to sharing that. Yeah. Um <clears throat> there's a phrase in the whole model building world it's called kit bashing. Kit bashing, yep. So combining kits with other kits. So in that sense that's what I'm doing. And then the word assemblage, you know, uh, as little as a word that is, hopefully that encompasses, you know, what the process is. But it's true. I never yeah. thought of it as assemblage, but it's it is. It's just a, yeah. like a totally different. It's different because all of the pieces are kind of, or most of the pieces are are of a certain, you know, they're all model parts basically, yeah. which makes it kind of I different. Yeah, I, I view it in different ways. It's kind of like, um, you know, the, the the mental state of being a hoarder, you know. <laughs> you know, mental illness meets fine art. <laughs> I love it. I have constant struggles with myself being a hoarder of things. Same here, man. 80% of the things that I have will never make it into a piece. But yet, I need this spectrum of things to make this yep. and so i'll start with a kind of central idea or object or something like this thing behind me is a, is a cat like i've never made a house cat 
centered piece and i'm very excited yeah because it's so cool it's out of my comfort zone and it looks amazing yeah but it's all about taking this shape that's been mass produced you know it's it's a product mm -hmm. and i correct it so you know the tail i didn't like on this cat the way it was so i moved it i had a oh. call giving him a little tiara you know i'm I'm replacing its original identity with something else. I'm adding, I'm subtracting, I'm hacking it, I'm remixing it. You know, so much in our culture today is about remixing things. And so, you know, the artist comes out with their single, then like five other people right. make the mix, you know, and like, oh, I like the remix more, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a. I see. I never thought. I, I've always judged your work from the perspective of it just looks amazing. It just looks cool, you know. Not kind of you know, sort of superficially in that way. But that's kind of how I am. It's like something either I like it or I don't, and I just you know, it just makes me feel good or it doesn't. And yeah. you know, obviously, there's the the church pieces and stuff where there's like, oh, I can see you know, there, there's a kind of a political meaning here. But um, that angle of, you know, re, you know, it's very kind of like uh, almost pop art in a way, like Warholian, yeah. where you're taking something that's mass produced and you're turning it into some amazing Baroque art piece where it was like a dumb cake decoration before or an army man, some kids, goofy kids thing. And you're turning uh, it into this like amazing <laughs> thing, which is, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome conceptually from a, like a, a, yeah. a conceptual level. And I could see why maybe, maybe that's part of the reason you're able to be embraced by the, um, that high end art world because they see that in it, you know, cause that's kind of yeah. high art. That's kind of very high concept. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I think also I had this, I had this wonderful art instructor, my painting teacher, and he would never ever, talk about subject matter with what you were doing. He would only talk about if it looked good design wise. Hmm. And so, you know, and I thought about that heavily where, you know, so many great works of art from any cultural context. So if you're from the middle of nowhere in the jungle and you look at a Da Vinci, you admire it because it has good intrinsic qualities of design. You may not understand it, in a cultural context or get into what the piece is really saying. But, you know, if you can capture that visually, then, you know, you've gotten this much of the audience, right? You know, this much of the audience will appreciate the subject matter. This much will be, you know, complete avid followers for the rest of your art career, you know? Mm -hmm, yeah. It's all interesting. So yeah, it's like that fine line of, you know, Mental health meets refinement and bringing it together. <laughs> and, you know, always I would hear this comment about like, you know, when you buy art, you don't buy a product, you buy experience. Mm, right. So people would look at my work and just think like, wow, like this guy did this for so many hours, thinking of this and putting this all together. And wow, you know. It's it's like, um, yeah, they 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 want a part of that and right. just have it on their wall, and so uh, yeah, I think it's that delving into those different worlds and bringing them together, bringing something that you know, the look of the old world, putting them into the modern world. Like I'm really fascinated with time, mm -hmm. all time into one. Yeah, it's 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 just, you know, it's just I feel kind of dumb because the more I think about it, the more I'm like it's fucking brilliant. Like con on a conceptual level, it's really it's brilliant. So that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, uh, thank awesome. you. It's yeah. Very much. It makes it makes sense though. Uh cuz yeah, it's just uh I don't know, very inspiring and, and um just amazing beautiful work i love it and uh we're all proud of you we're all proud of you down here down here in the uh, <laughs> in the trenches 
I know you're in your own trenches. I'm just kind of making a joke, but we're all like, I think, you know, I feel like I'm rooting for you. And we're all kind of rooting for you, like like I said, one of us that kind of made it, almost like someone from the punk scene that that gets a major label deal and maintains their integrity, and like or like Nirvana or something, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, then changes the whole thing, you know. So that's 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 yeah. cool. I, I'm a. Uh... Well, we'll have to talk sometime about uh, all the near misses and oh yeah, his career like. Uh, I think that's worth its own other podcast. I, like, I, I was. How- yeah, no, I was thinking, because um, I know you have to go and take your kids to school, but I was thinking uh, that I could go another couple hours probably easily talking to you. So um, I was, my first impulse was to ask you to do it, another, have another, do another podcast episode if you're down for it, because there's a lot of yeah. stuff I want to talk to you about. <laughs> yeah, know. there's a lot of other just, you know, interesting uh, things just, you know, on a personal level, what, you know, I had fed into the work and yeah you know so just the the technical side of I, doing yeah. something like you know you know the art of composing you know how is artists how do we compose something you know it's much like music like mm-hmm. the right placement of things and you know it's, it's just something to really geek out on I oh think. yeah yeah that's so, it's the that's right that's what I admire, admire about your work is you have this sick technique, but you've got this simplicity, but you say so much and just, you know, and that part of it. And so I, I really always appreciated your work and just the journey it goes in and oh, thanks. The, the personality in it. So, yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, I'm trying to take the, you know, uh, the, you know, it's like all my concepts come after the fact. I'm just really trying to enjoy myself and do something that I think is cool. And then it's like you kind of come up with the, your uh, your your um, artist statement, and you start. I always want to. I always want to ask you. Um, like this goes back to Strict Nine because I think you were in that studio before I was, but there was a number five on the wall, and I I don't know if I ever asked you about. Oh. Oh, in white the white the white chapel one or the uh, or the Berlin the the London. Uh, yeah, it was in, I think it was in Berlin. You had put the number five on there, and I noticed it in some of your paintings as well. I uh, I don't know if I did. I put did I put the five on the gallery? Uh, in the in the little side studio that they had there. Oh, I pro- it probably was me. <laughs> I, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, because I do put yeah. that in all my. Uh, it's my it's my spiritual number is what oh. it is. So I put it like in everything. It was my number. Don't forget that you learned all this cool stuff when I was like nineteen or I don't know, whenever nineteen eighty seven was where I had my big psychedelic experience and spiritual awakening. It was Oh wow. Yeah, I had I got the symbol and I got it tattooed so I would not forget what I learned and and <laughs> don't don't go back to being a a dumb dummy, basically. <laughs> That's worth the whole other podcast. Too. Exactly. That's what I mean. I know that you, you know, you've, you're, you're connected. So, um, yeah. So, so I'm gonna hit you up in the future and and ask you to come on again if you're cool with that. Yeah, you bet. Let's awesome. do it. Well, thank you. That was a really fun conversation. I appreciate you taking yeah. the time. Um, yeah, and. Uh, I mean, not that you need it, but is there anything that you want to promote or anything at the end here? Uh, no, I just thank you all for being such fans and supporters. I really, really appreciate you. Um, yeah, I wish we were able to be more connected in the world right now. But, you know, I want to thank Chet for putting this podcast together. And it's been a wonderful experience and really appreciate it. Awesome, man. All right. Well, that's a, that's a great uh, outgoing message. So, as 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 what's become um, tradition on this podcast, we say goodbye to the audience. So, say goodbye, audience. Bye bye. Take care. Bye, audience.